So if you're sitting around waiting for a new graphics card that is never gonna probably appear on the market, at least not anytime soon, you're probably trying to get faster performance out of your computer. Well, today you're in luck because we're gonna show you some of my favorite ways that you can get more performance out of your computer and it won't cost you a single solitary fucking dime. This video is sponsored by Micro Center and their custom PC builder. Use the custom PC builder to plan your next build. And when parts are added to your cart and in-store pickup is selected, you'll have the option for a Micro Center technician to fully build your PC for an extra fee. And if the order is placed at least four hours before closing, you can enjoy your new PC the very same day. Get the best prices and parts selection at any of Micro Center's 25 locations across the United States. And right now, my viewers can get a free pair of wireless headphones while supplies last in store only. To see everything that Micro Center has to offer and to learn more about this limited time free headphone giveaway, click the link in the description below. Okay, so these are gonna be the five things I do for any system if I'm trying to get more performance out of it. Look, the graphics card shortage sucks. Yeah, CPUs are, aren't as bad as they were at the end of last year. You can still get a new CPU and such, but graphics card shortages are meaning most of you are probably hanging on to your systems longer than you ever planned or you built a new system and you're just waiting for a GPU to go in there. But these are things that you can basically apply to any computer, whether it be new or old, to try and get as much performance out of it as possible. Now, some of these things may seem super basic, but with the amount of people that have joined the PC master race, I didn't come up with a name, guys. It's just what people call PC gaming, I guess, or enthusiasm, enthusiasts or whatever. These days, look, you probably already know a lot of these, but the amount of new people there are now to computers, they may not have any idea about any of these tips, and so it's gonna actually help some people out there. So number one, pretty much every single motherboard, whether it be basic or your high-end motherboard, is going to have some built-in enhancements into them. So the very first one that we're gonna recommend is to enable any of your XM XMP, which are your extreme memory profile for Intel uh, CPUs or DOCP, for AMD based systems, which will basically turn your RAM up to 10. When you buy a new stick of RAM and you plug it in, whether it's DDR3, DDR4, it doesn't really matter, there is a base clock. For DDR4, it's 2133 megahertz. So if you put the RAM in there, whether it's a 3000 megahertz stick, 3200, 3600, 2600, it's gonna run at 2133 out of the box without you touching anything, which means you've got extra performance in your memory that you may not even be aware of. So you go into your system BIOS by tapping a million times, delete on your uh, keyboard while you're booting. Then you can go in there and find the setting for your system and your motherboard to enable the extreme profile for your memory. Now one thing to keep in mind, this is actually a memory overclock. Anything above the base clock is considered an overclock. But what those DOCP and XMP settings mean is that that is what that particular DIMM or that particular stick of memory is rated up to. So as long as you turn that on and then do a test boot and everything works, you're gonna get more performance and more snappy response for your CPU because your memory speeds are now gonna be running at their tightest timings and their fat fastest frequency uh, that they were rated up to. Now it's not guaranteed that they're going to work. You can pretty much guarantee that anything up to about 3000 or 3200 megahertz will work on either Intel or AMD. But anything beyond that could start to push the memory controller in your CPU a bit farther than spec, which means you'd have to go and do some fine tuning with voltages uh, to get those speeds to run. So my recommendation is if you're running up to 3200 megahertz memory, then just turn on the XMP or DOCP. If you're running something faster than that, then maybe just kind of play around with the manual clocks where you go into the memory frequency and just dial in whatever the number is for that particular uh, stick and then give it a shot. Worst thing that happens is it doesn't boot, you clear your CMOS, and then you're up and running again. So it's free performance that most people may not even be aware of that they're not even running out of the box. Now number two also has to do with your motherboard and that's gonna be enabling core enhancement, whether it be an Intel or AMD based system. Pretty much every motherboard these days comes with some sort of an AI enhancement overclock built into the motherboard functionality. What these manufacturers do is when they're designing these motherboards, they have such a huge sample set of engineering samples of the CPUs from either Intel or AMD, they often know where they could set these pre-set overclock figures to know that it's gonna run pretty much guaranteed. They can put together these algorithms that say, hey, this is a safe overclock with the amount of voltage we would need to give it and the amount of frequency we're gonna give it and, and all of the sub timings and the, the sub control of the CPU voltages. Basically says you can get extra performance out of it with a one clock, a one clock, a technically a one click enable. Now an Intel based motherboard, you're gonna often see it referred to as either AI optimized or potentially um, core enhancement. And that's gonna do several things. One, it'll allow your all core turbo frequencies to run higher. 
out of the box, Intel-based CPUs, when you go all-core overclocks or all-core turbo clocks, they're gonna drop down quite a bit from the number you actually see on the box. Those numbers typically refer to either one or two cores uh, being loaded. But if you turn on automatic core enhancement, it's gonna allow the boost clocks to go higher for all core, and it's gonna allow it to stay at those higher frequencies for longer. Now, fortunately, if you're on an AMD system, it's a lot easier than that because you don't even have to go into the BIOS. You just download the Ryzen Master Utility, just click Automatic CPU Overclocking, and it will automatically do it for you. Oftentimes, getting you sometimes 200, maybe even 300 megahertz improvement over your stock Ryzen settings, which is a very tangible increase in both CPU and gaming uh, when it comes to CPU bound titles with games like Cyberpunk, Far Cry 5, Flight Sim, any sort of game that really leverages the amount of CPU power, you're gonna notice it basically linear with the clock speed. Now let's talk about your graphics card. This is probably the piece most people right now are trying to stretch their legs with because they have to hang on to it longer than they ever expected and they're starting to notice, notice newer titles or starting to make it sweat a little more. Uh, this is where a lot of people right now are really disappointed that they can't upgrade if they're trying. But if you are not running any sort of overclock on your graphics card, it might be something to consider. Now for NVIDIA based graphics cards, I recommend using MSI Afterburner. It's pretty much compatible with any NVIDIA and AMD, but I have another suggestion for AMD. But it's basically compatible with any NVIDIA graphics card. It latches onto the driver and you can basically start paying, playing with power sliders at that point so you can increase the power limit, you can increase uh, the target frequency, you can increase the memory frequency and increase your fan speeds. Now the two things I'd recommend, there's kind of a subcategories in this one here, is one, the very first thing I'd recommend doing, even if you're not comfortable touching the sliders for the overclocks, is increase your fan speed. Remember, both CPUs and GPUs have a logic built into them that says, make the frequency go up if the temperatures are low. The lower you can keep the temperatures, the longer and higher you will maintain the boost clocks for your graphics card. So what you'll notice is that if you increase the fan speed, allowing a trade-off of sound for performance, you'll notice that the clock speed will go up and it will stay up longer. Now, if you want the core clock to go higher than what you're seeing, that's when you start playing with incrementally that, volt, that uh, not the voltage slider, but the actual GPU slider, and then potentially the memory, it's just called mem, where you can start getting smaller overclocks. Now, if you're not comfortable, you don't really have to touch those sliders. Believe it or not, with the GPU boost logic built into NVIDIA graphics cards, uh, it will find most of that headroom automatically. You might find the graphics cards advertised at something like a 1760 megahertz uh, boost clock, but you're finding it go all the way up to 1900, 1950 megahertz, maybe even 2000 out of the box. That's GPU boost doing exactly what it's designed to do. Leverage extra power and temperature headroom to get you more performance. It will hold that performance longer if you bump up the fan speed. And then if you start moving those sliders, it's gonna add extra frequency on top of the GPU logic or the GPU boost logic, which means you can get even more performance. But I find there's obviously, uh, and, and most of the time, a more tangible benefit to just increasing your fan speed than actually playing with those sliders. Now for AMD-based graphics cards, what you can do is just use the Radeon software built into the driver. You can see here that it, it, AMD likes to have utilities to allow you to do most of this. So you would just open up Radeon software, just click the automatic overclocking feature, it will then restart the system and then you'll notice a tangible difference when it comes to the boost clocks. The same thing applies. The cooler you can keep it, so make the, the, turb or the fan run as loud as you can stand it, means it's gonna maintain higher boost clocks, which is gonna give you more tangible gaming performance. The nice thing about the software-based stuff is if you don't like it, you can just revert it, uninstall the software, and it doesn't apply until you actually open up the software unless you have it set to apply on boot. Uh, which then you can easily turn all of that off in safe mode if you ever had any sort of a problem. But the point is you can use that software without any fear of damaging your product. Now this one here might seem like extreme common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people maybe don't realize this. We talked about boost logic and we talked about turbo clocks in both your graphics cards and your CPU. CPUs, both Intel and AMD, also utilize a turbo clock logic that has everything to do again with power headroom and temperature headroom. If you're running a big, beefy heat sink cooler or an all-in-one water cooling loop or a custom loop, and you're not actually running your fans at a higher rate of speed or RPM, then you'd be surprised how much performance you could be leaving on the table, specifically if you're running an air cooler. Now, if you can keep the temperatures down, it will allow, especially with AMD uh, CPUs as well, to raise the boost clocks as long as it possibly can. So turn your system fans up. We're not just talking about the CPU cooler itself, we're talking about your case fans. 
People become so con concerned with the CPU cooler itself that they forget it's only going to be as efficient as the chassis at which it's within. So if you're not turning up your intake fans or you're not turning up your exhaust fans, you're getting hot, stale air not being exchanged at a high enough rate, then you're going to start seeing those boost clocks on your CP or the turbo clocks. They're boost clocks on GPU, turbo clocks on CPU. I always get those mixed up. But you're going to find the hotter the environment gets, the lower the clock speeds become, again, because of the fact that they don't like to run hot. The way that they try and keep the temperatures down is they start to reduce the clock speed. So if you are the kind of person that's like, I want performance and sound is a secondary concern of yours, then hook your fans up either to motherboard headers or to a fan controller that will allow you to intelligently start to control the fan speed. You can go in there and manually crank knobs and just say, I want a wind tunnel. I don't care what it sounds like. I want the performance. That's kind of the way I tend to operate. Then you can just run the fans at full speed. Or you can go in there and use a boost controller, which is pretty much built into every single motherboard these days. You have plenty of fan headers. If not, then you can cheaply off Amazon order some uh, splitters so that you can run two or three fans off of a single uh, header. And then you can start to control them with motherboard software. So as the load increases and the CPU temp comes up, the fans speed up so that they can keep exchanging the air within the chassis fast enough to keep fresh air in and hot air expelled. That way your turbo clocks do not start to boost down. That's one that I think many people forget about. They care about their CPU cooler. They stop thinking about their chassis fans which is ultimately responsible for everything, including your graphics card. Now, this last one has nothing to do with hardware at all. This has everything to do with OS optimization. Now, a lot of people don't know, most of the time when you install a piece of software in Windows, it almost always is gonna have a start with Windows function built in. Any game launcher, let's just be honest, GOG, Steam, Epic, pick one, Origin, they all by default are gonna wanna start when your system starts. Third-party software like MSI Afterburner, Adobe Creative Cloud wants to start with the system and then it wants to check for updates. But the point is you get all these processes starting up with the system, every single one of them, especially if they're connected to the network, like any of the game launchers, which will be doing installs or background checks or background news ticker updates and such, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, OneDrive, Skype, all of those use system resources. Although they may not be a huge amount of resources, the, the game launchers use way more than some of these other pieces of software. But any resource being allocated to that software starting up is gonna do two things. One, it's gonna eat up memory over time. And two, it's gonna create a slower startup condition for your system, especially if you're not running an SSD. If you're running a hard drive and you've got your, your startup items, just that folder is full, then you're probably spending an awful lot of time waiting around for your system to boot unnecessarily. So long gone are the days though of the older versions of Windows where they would just put all the icons of the running stuff across the bottom by the clock. No, I'm not talking about the actual windows down on the bottom. I'm talking about the little icon that you can right click and control. They shove all of those into a drop down now or pop up technically that shows you where everything is running. So you might look down there and think nothing's running, but you click that and you see you got 20 pieces of software running. So it's really simple to go in there and actually turn that off. You just go into your Windows startup, you go or into MS config, click startup, and then you can find everything right there that's listed that's gonna start whenever Windows starts. It will even show you your system impact at how much resources it uses. And you can just disable them right there. Rather than trying to figure out what software starts up and having to go to each one of them and turn it off, you can turn it off from that window really, really simple. I think that's something a lot of people forget about is you get excited to build your systems and over time your OS gets really fragmented with, with programs that have been removed and old registries and stuff. But rather than deal with registry cleanup and all that sort of stuff, just check your start folder. You'd be surprised at how much junk is actually sitting in there. And this last one is just an honorable mention. Technically, I already gave you five, but this is one I do with every single system. If you've got plenty of cooling, you're not concerned about the slightly potential higher increase in electricity costs at turning on high performance mode for Windows, whether it be an Intel-based system or an AMD-based system. Uh, fortunately, now the 20H2 version of Windows now lumps them together. There's no more AMD Ryzen power profile. It's just high performance. That's gonna allow your boost clocks to stay up. It's gonna keep things from pulling voltage and idling down, which means that your system is basically always running at full speed, ready to do whatever it is you ask of it. Nothing has to sort of wake up or have uh, particular you know, cores wake up and start to have the affinity jump all around. It's just always running full speed, ready to go. Now, yeah, there is extra power costs and temperature costs associated with that. But if you live in a cool climate, you got plenty of cooling in your system, or you just don't pay a lot for electricity depending on where you live, 
that might be a way to get a couple of extra percent out of your system. Now, I hope these tips have helped you stretch your computer parts a little bit longer as you wait for things to sort of normalize, or you're hoping that the bubble of Ethereum and Bitcoin is gonna burst, but who knows if or when that's ever gonna be. So if you've gotta make your computer components last longer than you were expecting, and you've not utilized any of these tips or tricks, give them a shot because the chances are you'll actually notice a difference in your performance of your system, whether it be snappiness and in, in general usage or better FPS and maybe smoother FPS in your games. So what are your best tips? I'm sure you guys have some down there. What is the one thing that you're guaranteed to do with every system to try and optimize it, regardless of what kind of computer it is? Sound off in the comments below. And as always, share this video if it's gonna help someone that you know that just built the system and can maybe benefit from these suggestions. And as always, we'll see you in the next one. I wanna knock that over. That's like, it's irreplaceable at this point. Some easy ways, I don't want to let that see my phone because I'm supposed to be smart and know this stuff in my head. Grab the motherboard. No.